The human capacity for self-delusion and rationalization is almost limitless. More and more um, chief financial officers compensation was getting tied to their ability to achieve earnings metrics. And he was like, this sums up the state of corporate America right here. Because in the end, a CFO shouldn't have any latitude over what the earnings are, right? to be here interviewing Bethany McLean. Bethany McLean is a financial journalist and actually you cover as well now non-financial topics, um, specializing in long form journalism, really in-depth uh, portraits and in Bethany's fame in the short selling world goes all the way back to her um, article on Enron. And so I'm really excited to, to have you with us, Bethany, is to thank you for being here for having me. Right. So one of the things that I, I'm always curious to understand about journalists who are in the financial journalism world, particularly those who moved from finance to journalism, is how did you, how did you get here? Um, I know you started your career out of college at Goldman Sachs as an investment banking analyst, um, but it'd be great to understand why you were there and why you stopped being there and were drawn to, work, to journalism? You know, I wish I had um, better answers to, to this. I, I, I was never one of those kids who had much of a, a life plan. So I had sort of an odd major as an undergraduate. I was a math and English double major. And I didn't know what investment banking was. Uh, when I was when I was in college, um, and I guess I'd probably always thought that I would go on to get my PhD in math, and I had this the great luck of working my, the summer after my junior year. Williams College, where I went, had one of I think it was the only undergraduate math research program, and I got accepted into it and did this the summer between my junior and senior year, and realized that not only was I not very good at math, but I really uh, didn't like it, and so I started my senior year absolutely not knowing what, what I was going to do and knowing I had to get a job. And investment banking was, while not really a natural path for me, for someone with a math major um, on a campus where investment banks came to recruit, it, it felt to me like a, like a good use of, of my math background. So that's how I ended up at Goldman. But I never had this, I never had this plan in my head of being an investment banker because I didn't even know what, what, what it was. And I guess during, during my there, I, I learned a lot, and I'm really glad I did it. But they were they were rough years, and I didn't think it was the right place for me over time. And I started to think, well, what what can I do that is both where, where I can use these these skills I've developed, but also be able to write. And so, business journalism felt like a natural a natural place. Back back in those days, the the big magazines like Fortune they they were they were big magazines back in those days. Uh, hired people as fact checkers, so you could you could get a job without having any experience in journalism, just because you you could check facts. And so that's how I got in the door. So it was all a little more happenstance than it was thought out, but that's how it came to be. How, how long were you at Goldman as an analyst? Only three years. So the analyst program at that time was was two years, and then you could stay for a, for a third year. Um, so I, I stayed for a third year. Okay. And had you considered at that point going and getting your MBA? Because that was obviously the usual progression for yeah, investment. Yeah, I was, I was actually accepted. I was on my way to Kellogg. I had a roommate. I was, um, <laughs> I was, I was, I was going and I just suddenly thought, well, if I want to be a journalist, then I'm going to get out of Kellogg and I'm going to have a ton of debt from, from business school. And I'm going to end up right back in a job like investment banking because I'm going to need to pay off my debt. And so if I want to do something, which is not as financially lucrative, then I need to do it now while I have at least some flexibility to, to do that. So I deferred business school and, and went to Fortune, and then I just never ended up going. But you were literally on your way to Kellogg at that point? I, or, I mean... I'd been to the campus. I had a roommate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your framework when you were thinking this through at that time. And I mean, that was a gutsy decision. I guess I didn't. I didn't see it as that gutsy at, at, at that age. It to me, I've always been pretty, 
pretty passionate about what it is I, I want to do. And, and the, the, the money has always been, I guess, secondary. So I didn't think it through from the perspective of career earnings or anything like that. I thought it through from the perspective of how I was going to be spending my time and whether I was going to be really excited about what, what I was doing and frankly, have the freedom to, which always meant a great deal to me, um, have the freedom to be able to pursue the things I was, I was interested in. I, realized during my years at Goldman, I, it, it seems small, but I actually think it's really important, which is how, how, you, how you like to work. Do you, do you like to be left alone? Do you like to be part of a team? Do you like structure? Do you not like structure? And I realized about myself, I don't like structure and I, I, I like having a lot of, a lot of independence. And so that as much as anything shaped my desire to be a writer rather than to be in, in the business world. Bethany, I read something that you had written several years ago about your time at Goldman, and you specifically mentioned discounted cash flow analysis and how there were times when you were told, change the discount rate so that you, you guys could get the, the result that you wanted to get. Um, I, I had a similar experience when I was at a large bank, um, and that was one of those moments for me when I really said, God, I, I think this profession is, is full of shit. I mean, what did you have a similar reaction or was it a little bit just more incremental for you? Um, and is that what really, you know, it, was it was it moments such as those that made you think about, OK, journalism, there's a lot to write about here. Yeah, I, I, I would like to be able to say yes to that, but it would make me sound more intelligent than, than I think I think I was. I definitely had those moments because when you start in finance coming out of a math background and you when you start at Goldman coming out of a liberal arts education as I did, you, you have these these teachers who come in and teach you finance. And I, I, I knew nothing. I mean, I'm not even sure I knew what a stock was. And so you expect to find the solidity in finance that there is in math because in the end, I feel like like there is kind of a core truth to a math proof. And so you expect financial models to have that same kind of um, core truth to them, for lack of a better way of putting it. And so it was a shock to me to realize that they didn't, that all of the numbers, all of the output was negotiable based on the input, and that the input wasn't grounded necessarily in anything, in any kind of truth. It was grounded in kind of what you wanted the output to be. And 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 I, I worked in the MA department at Goldman, so I wasn't in the in the in the research area. I was in a department where you sometimes are aiming for 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 an answer. Um, and so that was that it was it was a total shock to me because I kept expecting to find something that you could some kind of substantive truth. And even you know, analysis that looked at comparables, where you looked at where other companies were trading to say where this one should trade. Well, yes, I guess it gave you a range of some sort, but why was it right that these other companies were trading where they were? And even a DCF analysis, which felt more factual and more based on the the, the company's numbers, well, that was so dependent on exit multiples and, and discount rates, and all of those could be chosen not totally at random, but but somewhat at random, and and small the small moves could make could make a really big difference. And I think the lack of the, the, the lack of any kind of substantive truth at, at the core of it um, bothered me. I'm, I'm not sure that I left for journalism because I thought there was an opportunity to write about that specifically. I, I think I started in journalism actually as more of a believer than a skeptic and only accidentally became a skeptic. I didn't come out of Goldman having realized that the financial world was full of BS. Although looking back, I can see how I could have had that, that lesson and I'm sure it was brewing in me somewhere. Post leaving Goldman and when you began as a fact checker and then I assume writing stories. Um, was there a moment when you had this transformation and thought, you know, there's a lot of muck to rake here, or was this a gradual incremental process? I think it was more of a gradual incremental process, and it was it was twofold. One maybe which isn't, but but one thing that I, I realized right away is that a lot of what you read isn't necessarily accurate or just because something is printed in black and white doesn't mean it's it's true and I remember I almost think they should somebody should start a not-for-profit where you where kids in high school have to learn fact checking because man oh man the first time you're given a story to read to fact check and you just assume because 
really well written and it's in black and white that it, it typed that it must be right. And you read it and go through it and realize every single thing in it is wrong or isn't supported. It's that, that, that was a shocking experience for me. But I think more, uh, I had the luck when I was at Fortune of being assigned to write this column called Companies to Watch, which was essentially a stock picking column. And I very quickly at Fortune got a reputation for being maybe debatably smart, but totally unable to write because I had no training in, 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 in journalism and had never learned to think about to think about storytelling. And so I didn't get to do the kind of big profiles in the in in the magazine of the dot com billionaires. I was relegated to kind of the personal finance ghetto um, where I did this column, which was which was a stock picking column. And I've always felt like I should apologize to anybody who followed any of my advice because it was pretty awful. But that that was where I really grew up, I guess, because there were no shortage of people coming by Fortune with great stories, you know, analysts who would buy ratings on stocks at that time, portfolio managers who wanted press for their mutual funds, who would tell you all their stock picks and why, um, company management who couldn't wait to get in the pages of a magazine and would come by and give these really great um, presentations about how great their companies were. And I would write these stories and then watch in horror as the stock usually went in the opposite direction, because the more a company company was out promoting itself, <laughs> chances are it was a, an, an inverse correlation to how the company was actually going to perform, right? And that's when I started to realize, much to my shock, that just because a portfolio manager who ran a multi-billion dollar fund said this was a good stock, that didn't mean it was. Just because an analyst had a buy rating on a stock, that didn't mean he actually, that person actually believed the stock was a buy, and it certainly didn't mean the stock was going to perform well. And just because management could weave a really compelling story didn't mean that any of it was true. And that all was quite shocking to me, but I think really, really formative. You know, it's interesting hearing that uh, that view from the early part of your from the early part of your career in journalism, because um, being an activist short seller, does the accusation that a journalist is in the pocket of short sellers or is too beholden to short sellers is is thrown out there so quickly? And it gets traction, but it's it's interesting hearing this perspective that all of these people who are on the long side, I mean, were, you know, maybe I mean, I, I prefer, you know, to hear your, you know, your adjective, but maybe shameless in using um, journalists to try to push the story. Well, I. I always found it really strange because I heard that accusation for sure when I was reporting the Enron story from the Enron executives and from companies before that when I'd write critically about them that, oh, well, you're just taking information from, from short sellers. And I always thought, well, why? I mean, from a strictly analytical or intellectually pure standpoint, why does it matter? Because information is either coming from people who are biased because they want to see a up or information is coming from people who are biased because they want to see a stock go down. But why is one worse than the other? This is a market after all. Why does one have all these negative connotations, whereas one is a perfectly acceptable, albeit often not totally transparent, part of how, how the world works? And I always thought it's interesting because it's one way to me in which it's clear the market is far more emotional than it is than it is rational, because if you look at that from a rational standpoint, neither neither source of information should be better or worse than the other. They should be they should be equal. And yet one is held out as, isn't this great? This person is such a believer in this company. And, and, and the other is held out as these evil short sellers who just want to crush the American dream, right? And I remember getting in fights with, with, with people about this, even other journalists in the wake of Enron. I remember a Wall Street Journal editor said on a panel, well, we at the journal don't take information from short sellers because, because they're, they're, they're biased. And I thought, well, ev everybody's biased. It's the information that matters, not you have to evaluate the information on the face of it, not get tied up in, in who it's coming from. Do you do you feel like there's I mean more willingness to I guess gild the lily on the short side when you're being pitched a story than there is on the long side or opposite way or is it really just dependent on uh, the person with whom you're speaking? I think it's really dependent on the person to whom you're speaking, but my experience has always been the other way around, that short sellers have been far more rational, far more clear about what they don't know, have done far more homework um, than than people on the long side. And now this this is a biased perspective. And what I mean by, by, by that is that during my years at, at Fortune, 
you got a lot of pitches from people who just on the long side who just expected them to be taken without without the proverbial grain of salt. And I was never in a position at Fortune where I got sleazy or short sellers coming to me seeking to trade off any story I would do because Fortune's publishing schedule was always um, somewhat unpredictable and not instantaneous, right? You wouldn't know if you were a short seller that my piece was going to be in the paper the next day. You wouldn't even know when it was going to run. And Fortune at that time published every two weeks and it didn't publish online. So I didn't get the kind of, I'm sure those people exist, but I didn't get the kind of short, I know they exist, but I didn't get the short sellers coming to me who were trying to plant a story they didn't believe in in order to trade on it the next day. I got people who had a really substantive disagreement with a company and felt like it was doing real damage and potentially was going to cause investors to lose their money or people to lose their insurance or, 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 or whatever it is. So, so my perspective has been that short sellers do much more homework um, and I would always want to hear what they have to say, even if I end up not agreeing with it. But I recognize that that's a somewhat biased perspective. So why why did the Enron story come to you or that that, you know, initial, I guess you were really the first one to write um, a skeptical piece on Enron, I think, is is my understanding correct? It, it is. Um, a guy in the Wall Street, in the Texas Wall Street Journal, had done a small piece on mark-to-market accounting for the all the energy companies and why mark-to-market accounting was was flawed. But it ran in the Texas Wall Street Journal, and I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't know about it at the time when I had begun to work on the Enron story. Why do you think the Enron story came to you, or that that was really yours to break? Honestly, pure happenstance. And I think there is a lot of, look, there's a lot of luck in, involved in, in in life. I had met a guy who worked for Jim Chanos um, randomly. And after I met him, I continued to sort of pester him for, for ideas and to hear what they were thinking and to learn from them. And this was before the age when most short sellers would go on TV. It was obviously before the age of Twitter. So in order to have an end to what the skeptical world was thinking, you had to know people. So I became very conscious of trying to develop those relationships. And it was less from a, I want to take down corporate America standpoint than it was from a, I don't want to be wrong. And if I'm writing about a company, I want to at least know what the short community is, is thinking so that so that I don't give people really flawed advice, right? And so that be, And I started to realize that you know, information travels in these very separate spheres and and all the smart money in the short community may know something that is, is a fraud or something is really problematic. And that information, particularly in those days, may never make it into into the world of everyday investors. And I wanted to I wanted to be able to be a bridge for that so that at least I wouldn't be wrong and and give people advice that obviously in retrospect would would, would seem to be stupid. So I met this guy named Doug Millette who worked for Jim and continued to just pound him basically. And I think finally he was like, what can I do to make this person go away? So he said it was the fall of 2000. And he said, um, well, we're doing a lot of work on Enron. And if you can figure out how it makes money, let, let us know. And I, I found out later they'd actually, other people had heard, other journalists had also heard about, about Enron, but people thought, no way. People thought, oh, that's a lot of work. I'm too busy right now. And it just happened to be, right, that I that I was looking for something to write about at the time. And for whatever reason, I was oriented toward diving into it. I'm sure there are other ideas that have come to me. You know, ideas are mysterious, right? There are, there are ideas that come to you. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't, it doesn't click and you don't delve into it and you you miss the moment and for whatever reason everything lined up and i was i was i took out and runs 10k right away that's actually really interesting that um Kinikos said to you yeah we're working on enron we're trying to figure out how it makes money because that was really the seminal statement i think in your article was nobody understands how enron makes money and i always wonder when you wrote that article if you had a sense of how they made money, but you, you know, you just couldn't, or how they, you know, how their profits were generated, but you, you know, you couldn't support it and you were asking it more rhetorically, but it, it sounds like just genuinely speaking, there weren't a lot of, uh, I guess, good theories on what was going on at that time. Is, is that a correct read of the situation or, or did you have more, you know, if not knowledge, call it suspicion than um, 
you were able to uh, imply in the article? So the, the key thing about Enron was that it was an energy trading company, right? And because it was a trading company, its profits were really, really volatile. And Jeff Skilling, who was then the company CEO, didn't want a company with volatile profits because it would be valued like an investment bank at a 10 or 11 times multiple rather than the 20 or 30 times multiple that Enron was valued at. So he had this whole story about how Enron wasn't a trading company. It was just a logistics company. And really, its profits were extremely dependable and, and reliable every every quarter. But there were there were two problems with that. One was anecdotal, which is that if you talk to other people in the industry, which which I did, then say it's a trading company, right? That, that That's just how, how this business works. Then, then the other problem was that Enron had this division called assets and investments, um, where you really couldn't tell what was going on here, but it was obvious things were being sold, things were being bought, and those profits were getting lumped into the overall number that was supposedly being spent out of this logistics company, but it was obvious this thing was wildly variable and all over the place and you couldn't tell what was in it. And so the idea that this was a core part of a logistics business, it, it just, it just made, it, it made no sense. And then there were these disclosures of how Andy Festa, who's then the company's CFO, um, was running these these outside funds that did all their business with Enron. And that was also obviously incredibly strange. So I wouldn't say I had this great insight. I, I would never have guessed at the time that Enron was was what was going to collapse in, in, in six months. But it was clear that, that things just things just didn't click the way a, a math major brain, you, you, you want to see it all. You want to see the elements of the proof line up, right? It's, it's one, a good piece of training about being a math major is that elements of a proof each has to lead seamlessly to, to, to the next. And when it doesn't, it, um, it, it offends my brain. <laughs> so one of the things that has always struck me, um, when people talk about Enron, you know, they'll, uh, They'll say, oh, well, the U.S. has frauds, too. Look at Enron. Enron is this huge fraud. But my impression is that the fraud was really around the margins and that this was more story about how legal but stretched accounting um, yeah. combined with debt could bring a company down almost overnight. Um, I mean, you, you know the Enron story better than anybody out there, uh, at least – who wasn't with the company, how do you view Enron and, and what it really means? For sure, I think that's right. I'd use the phrase, I come to talk at Jim, Jim Chanos' class at, at, at Yale every spring, and I coined the phrase legal fraud to describe Enron, which which, which I really like because that's actually how I think a lot of, it's actually the story of a lot of business gone wrong to some degree or another. And what I meant by that is, is the Enron, Enron was really, really hard to prosecute in large part because a lot of what they did was, was actually legal. It had been signed off on by the accountants. It had been signed off on by the lawyers. It had even in some cases, like Andy Fasto's partnerships, been signed off by the board of directors. So you'd look at these things that seemed obviously wrong on the face of it and a complete misrepresentation of economic reality. And yet, according to the rules, it was it, it was perfectly legal. And so a lot of Enron's individual transactions, when you took it apart and went down to the building blocks, you discovered this this was legal. It was a total, total misrepresentation of economic reality, but it was legal. But then you take all these building blocks and you pile them on top of each other, and you have this completely unstable edifice because it's a company whose who's, who's financial statements completely misrepresented economic reality, even though almost every piece of it and arguably every piece of it actually actually was was technically legal um, and I think that's it's 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 really challenging um, it's it's basically following the rules while totally violating the, the spirit of, of the rules so what happened then because there were prosecutions there were convictions I mean fast out did some time in prison skilling only got out I think a couple of years ago um, I mean, was this really more about politics at that point than actual substantive legal violations in your view? Visit Zero's TV to watch the rest of this interview, as well as more great short selling content.